In this week's Q&A, I go over one of the most important topics, bigger than any production tip or trick or anything like that. It's really the why of you are producing. I also go over why you hear mixing engineers always say, use your ears for this, use your ears for that. I go into detail and explain why they keep saying that, why other producers keep saying that, as well as a couple other nice little tips and tricks that will definitely help you in your productions. So check it out. So to become a music producer, how should I go about it? So I assume you're you know, just getting into music production. Uh, when you're asking this question or you're in the beginning stages you haven't been producing very long um, my best advice here would be to make music that you want to make don't just copy other people's music and follow a trend make music that is emotional for you that should be at the core of everything that you do Reason being is music production is difficult. Become a, becoming a professional music producer takes a lot of time, years of practice, years of making tunes, and it can be discouraging at times uh, when producing and trying to get better and trying to make the best music that you know you can make or if you're not quite at that professional level yet. It can be very difficult and discouraging. And making music that is emotional for you will carry you on. This is what will drive you to get better and put in those long hours to become the music producer that you know you're able to become. That really should be at the core of kind of your why you're producing. You know, you're producing music because you enjoy this type of music. You get an emotion from listening to this music. This emotion uh, moves you and makes you want to create this type of music. So keep that in mind before really learning any, you know, before going to all your tutorials and learning all your tips and tricks. You know, that's more important. And I guess how you should start is make music. <laughs> That's how you should start. You should start making music. Start finishing songs. Finish songs. That's very important. No matter if they're good or bad, you should finish songs. That way you get experience for the entire production process instead of just, you know, working on a beginning stages, working on the beginning stages of a song or just, you know, stopping, you know, after you get some sort of arrangement down, you know, getting the initial idea making that initial idea, initial idea into an entire arrangement, mixing down the song and mastering it will help you become a better producer and a complete com complete producer and help you progress farther. So don't worry about, you know, if my music sounds good or bad. Finish music and know that you're doing the music production because you enjoy it and it is emotional for you. That is how you start. When starting a track completely from scratch, what do you like to lay down first? I find beginning with drums completely kills my creativity. But that's probably because I'm not first and foremost a drummer. For me, well, it really depends what type of music you're making. That makes a big difference for what I like to start with. You know, in general, it can start anywhere it can start with drums it can start with a vocal it can start with you know a melody really anything but there are you know certain genres that I like, I like to start certain elements with start certain elements so if I'm doing a let's say a future bass song or a song that is a little bit more melodic I will usually start with the chords and melody that's usually what I'll start with if I'm starting with a let's say drum and bass track with a lot of crazy bass sounds, very sound design heavy track. I'll usually start with the bass and drums. That way, I really get the main theme started first. With the melodic track, the core of your track is really the progression and the melody. For a drum and bass track, 
something with a lot of crazy basses, the core of your track is that crazy bass sound. So getting the core set first is important. Kind of the main theme of your song. Of course, you know, drums are important to a melodic song, like a future bass song, uh, but the progression is what, you know, gives that emotion and what drives the track, really. So getting that set first uh, is how I go about it. So it's really the core element, really. Uh, whatever the core element of the song is, I would start with that first. Of course, you don't always have to start with that. You know, if you find a sample that inspires you, if you find, you know, a percussion loop that inspires you, you know, go ahead and start with that. This is not, you know, uh, you, you need to follow this rule. It's just most of the time I'll usually start with the progression and melody. You know, sometimes I'll be searching and I'll find the loop, a drum loop, a vocal sample, or anything, and start with that because I'm inspired by that. That's really what inspires you. Uh, first and foremost, that's what you should go off of, what inspires you. Uh, if you don't find a sample that's inspiring you, then start with, you know, if you're working on a future bass tune, start with your progression and melody. Yep, build the core. That's really how I like to go about it. Um, you know, but experiment with different ways. You know, you might find, you know, that working with vocal samples first for a particular type of track really kicks off a track for you. It really gets you into it. You know, when starting a track, it's really finding that initial spark. There's always a moment when you're starting a track, when you're in the very beginning stages of a track, where you get excited, where that spark really does go off. You know, that could be, and that really could be anything. That's all dependent on you. Uh, what is emotional for you, that really goes back to kind of the emotion that I was talking about. Um, in the last question, uh, which was, you know, how do I start as a music producer? And, you know, finding something that's emotional for you, that's really important. Um, so that, you know, kind of spark will come from that emotion. Uh, again, highlighting why it's important to have, you know, produce music that's emotional for you. So you can create those sparks often. So, yeah, that's really what it is. It's about finding what, you know, sparks the creativity and then once that creativity sparks uh, and then beginning stages that's when it starts to snowball and you start to get more ideas and you progress through the track okay while well, mastering my metering levels are up to par with my reference track but the actual loudness does not match should I just keep bumping that volume until it sounds right I would say well it depends on you know really how much louder that track is how much or how your track will sound if you increase the volume and yeah it really just depends on how it sounds when you increase the volume uh, do, are the dynamics completely killed when you increase the volume is it start distorting uh, if the answer is yes to those then you do not want to push the track louder really for having a loud master it's about having everything balanced in the mix. So with the limiter, there's a ceiling to a limiter. And let's say here's your frequency spectrum. There's your frequencies. Let's say the high frequencies are a bit higher than the low frequencies in the mix. Here are the low frequencies and here are the high frequencies. They're louder. Oh, that's what I meant to say. They're louder in the mix. When you bump up the limiter, the louder frequencies are going to hit that ceiling first. They're going to hit that ceiling first, and you won't be able to get the lower frequencies louder because the high frequencies are already hitting the ceiling of the limiter. And if you pump up the limiter harder to get the low frequencies up, then you're also pumping up the high frequencies, which are higher in the mix. And they're going to just start distorting before you get the loudness of the low end that you want. That's why producers have a hard time getting their tracks loud and can't get it to the correct loudness. Balancing your mix. Knowing what elements hit the limiter first. Knowing how to tame those back. No, taming them back with EQing. 
reduction of volume, and finding out what works for your mix, really. Um, sometimes you could take away too many frequencies, and you can say, okay, the high frequencies are causing this kind of peak. Um, I'll tame them. You tame them, and your mix sounds flat now. Well, maybe you need to adjust other frequencies in your mix. Maybe you need to re rearrange some elements, do some different gain staging, change around the gain staging to get it to work right. That would be my suggestion. It's always track dependent. You know, what sounds are playing, how loud they are playing, how many frequencies are playing at the same time. That will that will decide how loud you can get your track before it distorts. So, you know, it really depends on how it sounds when you push the song louder. Um, you know, if it's a lot quieter, if your song is a lot quieter than the reference track you're going for, you know, you should really be listening to the elements in the track. If you have a bunch of different instruments playing at once and your reference track has like a kick and a bass playing and a vocal playing, the dynamics and frequency content of that song are going to be different. That's why it's really difficult to really, you know, compare tracks. It's really, every song is different. Every you know, a bass sound, you know, a dubstep bass sound compared to a deep house bass sound. They have completely different frequency content. So they're going to hit the limiters differently when you bring them up. All the sounds coming together in that deep house sound song versus the dubstep, dubstep song are going to create a different frequency spectrum because the character of the sounds are different. If the character of the sounds are different, they're going to output a different volume. If they output a different volume, then you can only push the limiter so hard. You can only push the limiter to what the specific frequency content is telling you. So hopefully that helps. You know, it really depends on if it's going to distort or not, and if the dynamics are completely killed, and really how much louder is it? You know, if it's really not that big of a difference, then I wouldn't worry about it. If your mix is balanced and the volume isn't that far off from your reference track, then I wouldn't worry about it. Maybe listen to other songs in that style or genre and see how they compare loudness-wise. And if it's not that big of a difference, then I wouldn't worry about it because when you play it out, you know, they'll only have to change the volume only a little bit. So it's not like they're having to boost up the volume of your track a lot. But limiting, yes, limiting can be... Or getting your tracks loud, that, you know, it's tough. It really all comes down to your mix. And really finding out what works is experimenting. Um, that's once again why I recommend rebuilding other people's tracks. Uh, exactly. Try and copy the exact sound design, the exact notes, everything exactly. Usually this would be better if you had an instrumental, of course or a song that doesn't have vocals because um, you might not have the acapella of these vocals or you know maybe just do certain sections of a song that could work also if you don't want to do a full song and then you know master it that way you can hear where you know what sounds what frequencies they have that come together to allow you to get this loud master that is another suggestion for that. Um, replicating, you know, other tracks. Recreating other tracks. That'll help you understand what frequency content, what specific types of sounds come together well in order for you to get a loud master without distorting. What do you prefer in mixing mastering? Stereo or do you go into mid-sides? So I definitely like to go into mid-side processing, uh, especially in the mix. Reason being is mid-side processing gives you another dimension to work with. Um, when you use an EQ, a normal EQ, 
and you EQ out 500 hertz, you're EQing out the mid and the stereo parts of the stereo field or the sides of the stereo field. When you're using a mid, you know, a mid side EQ and you're on the mid mode, you're just EQing out the mid of the stereo field. When you're on the side mode, you're EQing out the sides of the stereo field. So it gives you another dimension to work with. This will be will give you the opportunity to get a cleaner and fatter mix, a more three-dimensional mix. Because you're working with the stereo field, and the stereo field gives your song that three-dimensional sound. So I would recommend using um, MSED, the Voxango MSED, and playing around with that free plugin. And this plugin is a gain knob for the mid and the side of the stereo field. You put it on any channel you want, your master, uh, your you know, snare drum, anything, and you can manipulate the gain of the mid and the sides of the stereo field. And you know, if you're new to mid side processing, I would say, you know, experiment with that. You know, use a lot of it. Uh, know that your the song that you are mixing won't turn out that good in the first place if you're learning this technique first because you're learning it. You're learning how it sounds. You're learning how to fit together elements. How's it going, Jason? Thanks for joining, man. Thanks for joining. You know, personally, I like to use mid-side EQing. This really helps fit my instruments together, especially when layering. I'll like to cut away the mid information of instruments that don't give my song that mid range, that low end power, uh, that bass sounds do. So a uh, good example, good example. I have a bass sound playing and I have a uh, big wide synth playing together. You know, oftentimes, you know, obviously it depends on the specific sound. But if I have the synth playing, I'll want to EQ out the mids of the low end frequencies or low mid frequencies to leave room for the bass. And the bass, you know, really provides the power and weight to your track. And mono information gives your song that weight and power. So knowing that mono information gives your song weight and power. I can EQ out the mid of the low frequencies of the synth to leave room for my bass to shine through. That will allow you to fit more elements together. Your track won't sound weaker because you're letting that bass shine through. You're letting the instrument that you want to occupy that frequency range to shine through. And it helps you create a more three-dimensional sound this way, rather than just EQing out, you know, 500 hertz on your synth with a normal EQ. This would also EQ out the sides at the 500 hertz. But what if that 500 hertz in the sides of the stereo field is adding to the power of that synth and the weight of that synth? You're EQing it out when you don't have to. It's not conflicting with that bass sound that's in you know, the mid, that's providing that weight in the mid. It's not conflicting. It's on the sides of the stereo field. And the weight and the power of the bass is at 500 hertz in the mid of the stereo field. So that's how you can kind of you know, see that you can create a more three-dimensional mix. Obviously, this is sound dependent. Uh, you'll have to listen to you know, individual sounds and see how you want to EQ them. Uh, but the rule of thumb is, what instrument do you want the listener to hear the most of? And in what part of the stereo field do you want the listener to hear this sound the most? That's how you decide what to EQ. Because there's really no hard and fast rule. You need to EQ this in the mids. You need to EQ this in the sides. Uh, this is going for EQing and compression in general. Really any processing. Uh, producers always say, well, I should always EQ this here, EQ that there. That's always wrong. 
it's always sound dependent. Every single sound in your track has specific frequencies. Every single track that you work on, how the sounds come together, will all create a different mix than anything you've heard before. It's usually unique. So if all the different frequencies coming together are different, then you would want to process them, EQ them, compress them differently, right? Um, the reason that people always say, well, use your ears, use your ears for this, use your ears for that, is because music production is ear training. That's what it is. You could have all the technical skills in the world, all the best frequency analyzer tools, all the best techniques, but if your ears aren't trained to know what sounds good together, none of that matters. It's about training your ears to know what sounds good together, what comes together good, and what paints the overall picture that you want to paint in your music. That's what matters. And really the only way to get trained ears to know what sounds good together is with practice, is with a lot of repetition, and with years of practice. You know, you see all these young producers that are like 16, 17, and you know, they're great, and you're like, well, how do they how do they do that? They've been producing, you know, only for so long. Um, you know, a lot of these kids have been producing since they've been like 10 years old, you know, that are really good, you know, at like 15, 16. Uh, that's what I've noticed. Like, they've either played musical instruments, uh, they've been producing on DAWs, or they've just been, been around music. They've done something music-related. And that has carried over with them over the years. So it's, you know, pe produce, people don't become amazing producers overnight unless you're just some, like, genius. Um, it doesn't happen. It takes years. It takes years. So if you're not willing to put in years of work uh, to get better, then this isn't for you. <laughs> This definitely isn't for you. Um, and that goes, once again, back to the uh, very first question that I answered in this stream, which was, how do, you know, I'm a, kind of a beginner producer, how do I start? And I answer that by saying, make music that moves you emotionally. And making music that moves you emotionally will help you go through those tough times of, you know, trying to get your song to sound right trying to get that mix perfect, putting in those very long hours, those long years to get better, to become the best producer that you can be. If you're writing music that you that moves you emotionally, that is what will carry you on. That's all that matters, how you feel about your music. Nothing really else matters. And that will help you progress. That will help you put in the hours. That will help you train your ears. And that'll help you get a better mix, make better records, and become a better producer. So thanks for sticking around for the Q&A, guys. So I hope my explanation of emotional music, music that moves you, is really the driving factor for what you should make. I hope me explaining that helped you in the right direction to what type of music that you want to make. Or if you're kind of, you know, lost, if you're, you know, an advanced or intermediate producer and you're kind of, you know, getting bored with production or you're not, you know, producing the music that you want to. I hope that that has kind of, you know, re-energized you and helped you get back on track to making music that you like to make. So once again, if you have any questions about this Q&A, you would like me to explain anything further, go ahead and put that in the comments. And if you want to get your question on the music production Q&A, all you have to do is show up in the Facebook live stream every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I would be happy to answer your question and get it on the stream and on the YouTube video. See you guys next week.